favor, turn to somebody next to you, look them in their eyeball and say, I like you a whole lot. And you may be seated. Hey, there's nothing cooler than a female playing bass. You're a rock star. I was so proud of you. You ain't a girl. Amen. You may be seated. Come on, you happy to be a CFNI student? Say yes. Come on, second semester, third semester, fourth semester. You still got the fire, right? You guys still have it? Don't let these first semester guys out, out cry you. Um, I want to just take a moment. You may, not, may or may not know this, but um, I'm the president of Christ for the Nations Network, formerly known of, as FMC, Fellowship of Ministers and Churches. And so when you graduate Christ for the Nations, there is a network of relationships for you to be connected to for ministry. We license and we ordain. And uh, today is our annual meeting with our presbyters and our board. And they're here, uh, graduates, uh, collectively, I was thinking this through earlier, collectively, they've got hundreds of thousands of ministry hours they make themselves available to mentor and pray with and encourage and strengthen those who come into our, uh, into our network. And I'd just like to honor them for a moment. So uh, Christ for the Nation Network, Presbyterian and board members, would you guys stand up over here? I think I saw Scott in the back. Scott, wave back there too. Scott's back there. These guys up front, they're rock stars. Let me just tell you, okay? They are rock stars. Let me say this to you. I think all of you are graduates as well. Is that right? You're graduates of Christ for the Nations? Yeah. And so, so, uh, so this, is, uh, this is the DNA of Christ for the Nations going forward into ministry. And they've aligned themselves to be available as you graduate to come into partnership with us, have some oversight, have some care, have some concern. And they minister around the world. And um, so it's a privilege. Now, I am excited because, as you guys know, uh, Dr. Brown actually comes and ministers here uh, because I begged and pleaded with him three years ago to make us part of his regular stop. Now, if you don't know and understand the gravity of what God has done with Dr. Brown, he is, in my mind, a foremost, uh, I'll call him, uh, I would say the, but he gets mad about it, so I will say a, uh, foremost um, charismatic Pentecostal theologian. In most days, when you study your little, uh, your little tools on this theologian says this, a lot of those guys are not spirit-filled and do not um, see through the eyes of the Holy Spirit. Um, they're great men and women of God, but for me to have someone who prays in tongues and says this is actually what this word means, to have his doctorate degrees in, um, in biblical languages. So when he says the Hebrew says this, that's what it says. When he says, no, the Greek is it, that, that's what it is. And so for me, um, and then to, as of recently, to watch the Lord use him apostolically for the United States, specifically in some of the big turmoils and difficulties. And Dr. Brown, publicly, I wanna say thank you for how you've handled um, and been involved in, you didn't need to get involved with the IHOP situation, but you did as a father in the faith and you knew you were gonna take it on the chin for being involved in it. I wanna thank you personally for doing that because those are my people and to know what they were going through. I wanna thank you for that so much. And so, as you know, I know uh, some of you have these different responsibilities, uh, but when I have a general in the faith like this here to speak to us, um, I really want to help you get a little bit better. Some of you um, have the old folks who say ants in your pants. Uh, you jump around, you move around, and I'm asking you to pay attention, to uh, take good notes. If you're having to leave early because of something, then sit yourself on the edges towards the back. Nothing more distracting to us as ministers than when someone up front says, oh, I got to go potty real quick and gets up in front of the cameras and everything. So let's not do that. And then, you, you know, I've asked you um, to be very honorable when we have great ministers like this uh, to give them your attention. And I know some of you take notes on your cell phone, but it looks like a lot of times that you're, uh, that you're searching the web for Poshmark, what you're going to buy for the next uh, meeting that you have. So let's don't do that. So without any further ado, would you give my hero and a great man of faith... Dr. Michael Brown, give him some CF and I love. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. I, I truly appreciate it. And the truth be told, Pastor Adam didn't have to beg me to come. Once he gave the invitation, it was a joy to do it. 
So I first want to acknowledge the champions who showed up for the workout last night. Stand up if you were part of it. We have some third year folks, but others. All right, awesome. A few, a few that were there were not here this morning. But every time I've done a workout with the CFNI gang, aside from coming out on top, that's just the fruit of healthy eating. But everybody always finishes. So you have only champions here. Come on, give yourselves a hand. These guys persevered and did it. And they showed the CFNI heart and grit. All right, I had told you that I'd be able to stick around right after class today for questions. I forgot that I'm going with the, the, the presbyters immediately after. But tomorrow, the whole session uh, is going to be for Q&A. And if we don't get to everybody, I'll be able to stick around a little after. But be, be in thoughtful prayer. Um, ask tomorrow as if, the, it's as if it's the last time you ever get to ask me a question. You know, not just a random Bible question, but something for life, practical ministry, because we, we want time to count. And then, of course, we'll, we'll be with you tonight. Let's pray. Abba, we love you, and we thank you. We, we don't know how to thank you enough for bringing us into your family and making us sons and daughters. We, we ask you, God, to help us to see and understand what this really means and to, to continue to take us deeper. In Jesus' name, amen. I uh, want you to turn with me to John 13. John chapter 13. I don't have any slides or notes for you today. So over the decades, it's been my joy to pour into thousands of students like you here in the States and in other parts of the world and to look in, in your eyes and their eyes and see fire and passion and desire and hunger and devotion and dreams and visions and the purposes of God just glowing through you. And I could take you around the world today and introduce you to people bearing amazing fruit that we got to pour into. I would also have to introduce you to some who are now backslidden, sat where you sat, prayed, worships with hands raised, looked in my eyes with that fire, and they're backslidden. Others, I remember when they were married, performed their wedding, now they're divorced. At least one committed suicide. Think, how? How, how, could, how could you be here in the presence of God, worshiping, encountering him? How could you have these dreams and purposes of God in your life and, and, and be intimate with him and yet end up messing up or falling away or getting off course or having your life disrupted? The reality is that's this world. It can happen to anyone, but it doesn't have to happen to anyone. None of this has to happen to a single person here. And because God has given us promises to keep us, Right, and, and he's incredibly faithful and merciful. The longer I walk with him, the less trust I have in me and the more trust I have in him. And as I've been going through some documents and journaling of the history of my life for some things I've been putting together, I'm amazed at how many times he intervened and how many times he got involved and how many times he got me on the right path. So the principles I wanna share with you today and we may go into tomorrow, are, are principles, if you just take hold of them, they're really simple and basic. But if they can become real in your life, you'll never mess up. You won't be a casualty. You may hit some walls, make some mistakes, we all do. But if these things can be deep in you, you won't mess up. Second Peter 1 says, if you do these things, you'll never fall. So there are principles we, we live by. Look, if, if I just stay right here, I'm not gonna hit either wall. It's that simple. So. John 13, it says, it was just before the Passover festival. Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and to go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The evening meal was in progress and the devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Now look at this, verse three. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power and that he had come from God 
and was returning to God. Now just stop for a second. What does he do next? Does he raise his hands and say, Father, demonstrate your power. And it's like the Mount of Transfiguration and the glory comes down, the cloud comes down, or maybe fire comes out of his hands like lightning. No, no, look, look, at, look at what it says. Look at what it says. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drawing them with the towel that was wrapped around them. This is what slaves did. It was really, I don't know if you've ever been in a, a setting or a ceremony where someone washes your feet. It's, it's really hard to have your feet washed. And in the ancient world, you, you go take a bath at the bathhouse or the river, and when you walk home, your feet would get dirty, right? Because you didn't have perfectly paved roads, your feet would get dirty. So you have water at home to, to wash your feet. And if, if you had enough money, you have a slave that would do it. It's it low labor, the, the lowest of labor. So look at this again. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he does something that's completely lowly in the eyes of people because he was secure in his relationship with God. If, if this can be something real and deep in you, not how you perform, not competing with others, not what people say about your titles, but if you can be secure in your relationship with God and his purposes for your life, you can get low, you can get low, you can be teachable, you don't get into competition and battles, you don't look at, at others as, as competition, you look at them as colleagues. So much happens that is detrimental to us in life and ministry because of insecurities. Because we look at other people as threats, because we're so concerned about what people think of us. But when we are secure in God and we know who we are in him, and we know his purposes for us, regardless of what they look like to the world, we know his purposes, we can get low. We can serve. We can humble ourselves and we can avoid all kinds of offense. Let, let, me, let me give you an example. Let's say you preach your very first message, right? You, you've been praying, you've been, you're nervous about it, you're, but you preach your very first message. And at the end of the message, your best friend comes up to you and says, if I were you, I'd quit while I'm ahead. I was like, that was a bad message, man. I don't think this is your calling. That'd be pretty devastating, pretty painful. Now let's change the scenario. Name for me a Christian leader today that you have like massive respect for. Name somebody. Dr. Brown. Okay. <laughs> Dr. Brown. Right. Okay. Okay. Well, we'll use me reluctantly. Okay. Let's, same deal here, same deal. You just preached your first message, right? And maybe it wasn't the best message, but you, pre you, you don't know how it went. You feel kind of good, but you really don't know how it went. Someone comes up to you and says, hey, I, I just got a text message from Pastor Adam. Now, Dr. Brown was watching that, and he wants to meet with you. So we, we go into a private room, and I sit you down, and I say, listen, God has showed me that your ministry is, is going to be 10 times bigger than anything I've ever done that I'm gonna seem like a little child compared to how God uses you in the days ahead. But listen, that was the worst sermon I ever heard in my life. I mean, you need a lot of work, but I'm gonna help you. You'd be like, tell me, go ahead, tell me. Tell me what's wrong, right? Because you're, you're now secure. You now heard that affirmation. And because it's like, tear me down. Just, I don't care, just you write the words. Just, you know, I'll, I'll learn to speak English better. Because you have this sense of purpose and destiny that, that you can now receive, but when you're insecure and, and, and when you don't have that sense of friendship with God and fellowship with God, and God saying, hey, I got your back. I'm with you. I'm for you. I got a plan for you. And, and, and you're gonna, and I'm rooting for you in that sense, right? Everything changes. Everything changes. So I'll, I'll tell you a story that happened right in this building decades ago. I've told it in other settings, but never, 
with any identity. So it's decades ago, first time I'm speaking here, just barely past 30 years old, so I looked like one of the students. And it was the annual Israel Day. I was going to be doing the keynote session at 11. So I was really honored. I was teaching at the school on Long Island, now got invited here. I was really honored. And um, Dennis Lindsay's mom, Frida, going to be presiding over the service the next day. What an honor to be here. So one of my friends said, hey, do you, you want to go Thursday night? I think it was Thursday night. To the, we, we're here already to check out. They're rehearsing for the Israel celebration. They're doing dance and music, and they're rehearsing and stuff. And I thought, sure, let's go. Just check out what's happening. So I go with my wife, Nancy, and it's actually her sister. And um, we're here, and the, the, they had, you know, special things set up, and somebody is overseeing the, the band for the songs, you know, for the special Israel day, right? And the drummer, Jewish music, you know, different ethnic music has different sounds. So a lot of the Jewish songs, like mpa, mpa kind of beat, you know, this upbeat kind of thing. And the drummer was playing it the wrong way. He was playing it like it was kind of a rock beat. The, and, and he was putting the emphasis on the wrong place. So being a drummer myself and knowing the Jewish music, I, I went up to the guy that was coordinating. And I said, hey, do you mind if I, if I show the, the drummer the right way to play this? So he just thinks I'm one of the students coming up here, disrupting the rehearsal. And this dear brother, I don't know who he was, what his name was, this dear brother looks at me with absolute scorn and says, no, just like that. And he starts to walk away, he looks at me again, he goes, no. And then one more time, just looks back and mouths out the word, And Nancy saw it and thought, that's not right. But I wasn't bothered at all because I knew the next time he saw me, I was going to be on that platform wearing my three-piece suit sitting next to Sister Lindsay. And this dear brother may have just been coordinating things for the day, whatever. The next day comes running up on the stage, and I'm there sitting next to Sister Lindsay. He goes, I had no, I am so sorry. I had no, I am so sorry. And that stuck with me because ultimately that's how you want it to be on Judgment Day. That Jesus has his arm around you and all the critics and the attackers are like, oh, we didn't know you guys were close. We didn't, we didn't know you had this relationship. So that, that's what's got to carry you. Not your performance, not people's evaluation, not, not the, the moment, the, the you know, there's a saying in boxing, you're only as good as your last fight. It's like, well, how did I do my last time, my last... Birth? No, that, that's not it. Are you solid in your relationship with God? And this is not to attack or to say, you got to get more... It's to say, whatever it takes to get to that place to find security in Him. Many times our upbringings are such that parenting we got doesn't get us into a, into a healthy way of viewing God or our own, our own weaknesses, whatever it is. As, as I started doing ministry, I, I was so surprised to see that sometimes my success was a threat to someone else. I thought, well, why would that be? It, it, it should be that we're colleagues. You know, if we're on the same team and, and you can score more than me, it's like, well, let me pass the ball to you because we're trying to win as a team. And as I began to look at it more, I, I realized that, a lot of the struggles, church splits, not all, but many were due to lack of security from the senior leader. And instead of saying, hey, I'm going to raise you up, and God's really using you, so I'm going to let you preach more. Uh, uh, no, instead it was like the, the children of Israel, when they were saying Saul has slain his thousands and David his tens of thousands, Saul got jealous. Instead of saying, that's the enemy that's being killed, I rejoice. So when you have that sense of knowing the favor of God. Just having a sense that, hey, it's, it's gonna be all right. God's purposes for your life are gonna be accomplished. There's tremendous security. You, you know, it's, it's like, why does this one get money? Why does this one get a scholarship? Why does this one get this? And then suddenly you get a million dollars given to you, now you're happy for everybody. It has to be the deepest thing in your life is not ministry identity, not, not how well you are doing but being a child of God, being a son 
or daughter of God. Maybe this was you when you were a kid. Maybe you've seen it with other kids. But the, here's a little boy with a weird haircut and a weird outfit. And, you know, he seems very sure of himself, but he stands out. He's different. And then one day you meet his dad, and that's exactly what his dad looks like. So he's good. He's like his dad, and his dad affirms him. He's good. So if you can have that, that sense, that confidence, it also enables you to humble yourself more. And one thing I've learned over the years, because I made so many mistakes and, and, and did things in zeal that was wrong, whatever, is that getting low is a good place to be because God gives you grace. He resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. And when you're secure in him, it's easier for you to humble yourself. And, and you don't want God against you. Whatever you want, the thing that is the worst of all, you don't want God against you. He resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. As, as a new teacher, as a new professor, in my late 20s at CFNI on Long Island, I learned pretty quickly that the biggest thing was not how gifted the student was, but how they responded to correction. And over the years, everyone would get the time that they were supposed to get from me as a professor or whatever input they needed in my life for something they were doing. But the ones that got extra time, the ones that I went out of my way to be with and help were not the ones that seemed like the superstars or the amazing, you know, gifted singer, speaker, charisma about them if they didn't receive correction well. And the ones that received correction well, I poured into. Didn't matter if they didn't look like they had anything going for them. If they would take it in, that's what I was looking for. Guys, guys, disrespect, man. That was a long wait. You could have been expelled for that. Got to do better. Got to do better. Honor Jesus, honor me, honor one another. If I pause that long and you don't even hear it, that's sin. Do better. It is. <laughs> you want me to pour into you guys and then play games? Come on. I don't want you to be a casualty. Bad habits here or bad habits out there. That's reality. I don't care about me. I don't care about being disrespected. I care about you. Listen, I, every day I get hated, maligned, lied about online by the second. Literally by the second. The only reason that bothers me is because I can't help those people because they won't listen to me. I don't care about me. You're still caring about you. You got to get born again then <laughs> or get in a deeper relationship with God. I just care about you. I want you to do well. That's it. Amen? Amen? So go with me to Proverbs chapter 3. Proverbs chapter 3. It's an extraordinary verse, two verses. Beginning verse 11. Proverbs 3, beginning in verse 11. The Hebrew actually starts with the words, the chastisement of the Lord. That's how it starts. Musar Adonai b'ni altim as. The chastisement of the Lord, my son, don't despise. And don't abhor his rebuke. Why? Verse 12. Because the Lord disciplines those he loves as a father, the son he delights in. Hebrews 12 says that those that don't receive discipline are illegitimate children. Because they're not your own kids, you don't discipline them. But a sign of love is discipline. In 1992, I received a call from the wife of the senior leader of the ministry I was part of. I was leading the ministry school in Maryland, Messianic Jewish ministry part of a leadership team with a senior leader. His wife called and said, Mike, my husband and I have just been concerned something seems a little off in your ministry lately. 
Now, she wasn't completely clear in what she was saying. I didn't really understand what she was trying to get at. But I responded, rather than trying to really understand, I responded defensively and told her, you need to come out with me on the road and see what's happening in meetings and how God's using me. And he's really using the books that I've written. She said, the books are different. I was thinking, okay, well, the books are pretty intense. They're pretty strong. So what, what she saying? Well, I, I didn't get what she was saying, but my sin was I responded with pride. So not long after that, I'd just been in New York City. I was preaching regularly for David Wilkerson at Times Square Church. And um, I get a call from his administrative assistant. Now, she would set up the meetings, set up schedule. Okay, are you free these dates, these dates? And I put it on the calendar and preach. That was my home away from home. I lived in Maryland, but I was there all the time. I preached 40 or 50 times there over the years. But he never called to talk to me on the phone. I would always meet with him face to face when I was there. This time, he wants to talk to me on the phone. That never happened. And for those of you who don't know David Wilkerson, he was a wonderful man of God, used with his brother Don to launch Teen Challenge ministries around the world, um, but very intensely prophetic. As many times as I sat with him, the dozens of times I sat with him, sometimes one-on-one -on -one alone in his office or having a meal together, I never felt relaxed. I, I said, I used to tell people it's like fellowshipping with a razor blade. <laughs> That's just the way he was. And, and, and sometimes, you know, we'd sit there, he was very compassionate. He cared for the down and out of the hurting person. But we'd sit down and he'd just look at me, hey, how you doing, Mike? And I'm like, brother, I'm, this is what I want to say. I'm clean, really. I had a good week. I haven't, I haven't really sin I sinned. I sinned a little, but it wasn't like a bad sin. I mean, just, you felt like you just had a, you know, you were like sitting with a prophet. So he wants to talk to me. So he's 61. I'm 37. And he actually misunderstood something that I said in a private conversation. But that cued him into something. He began to speak to me about something that he saw in my life where I really needed to hear what he was saying. Otherwise, it would greatly impact my future ministry and, and I'd reach a fraction of the people I was supposed to reach. And then he proceeded to tell me that the reason he could see this is because God showed him the same thing. And he saw a certain similarity in our callings. I'm not David Wilkerson anywhere near him. That's not the point. But he saw a certain similarity in our calling. And because God had shown this to him, and, and some of the other leaders at Times Square Church had helped speak this into his life. He, he said, they won't see this in you, but I see it because of our similarity. And, and, I, and you need to get this. You need to receive this. So I said to him, Brother Dave, when did God show you this? And he said, about a year and a half ago. So I'm thinking, hang on. If you learned this when you were 60, and I can learn this when I'm 37, that's put me way ahead of the curve. So we talked for like an hour and got off the phone and my wife Nancy was eager to know, okay, what happened in the conversation? So we just sat down on the floor in my office and I started crying. And she said, why are you crying? I said, because God loves me enough to correct me. I felt this tremendous love from God. In fact, I, he has corrected me so many times over the years, I feel like one of the most loved people on the planet. <laughs> I literally felt special. And immediately my mind went to, to other young ministers that had kind of suddenly shot up to stardom. And I don't, I'm not there to judge them or tear them down or attack them. But something always seemed missing. And there was a lot of flesh and strut, a lot of self. It didn't, it, it's, it almost said that they had bypassed the cross. They, they, they were walking with a strut rather than a limp. And I remember feeling God's not letting that happen to me. God's so merciful that he's intervening in my life. So rather than receiving the correction in a negative way, I realized this is God's love for me because of his purpose. So I'm saying that as one who, who continues to be corrected by the Lord. I don't mean some grievous, terrible sin, but just things he continues to, to speak to me. As, as I just turned 69 and I... You know, talking to Nancy the other day, she goes, 
It's about time you learn some of these things. You're almost 70. It's like still, still trying to become more like Jesus. But if you can have that sense, God loves me enough to correct me. Even when I just was very strong with a couple of brothers here, it's out of love. It's, it's purely out of love, wanting to see God's best for your lives. It's the, that's the whole motivation. If we can receive it like that and you get low, you won't mess up. You, you'll never mess up because God will have your back. And it's such a simple thing. And, and look, our pride does come up, especially out of insecurity, right? So the more secure we are in the Lord, the more readily we can receive correction. And while I, while I, when I'll ask Nancy for input on something I've written. You know, if, if you're a creator, writer, artist, musician, something, you produce something, you feel good about it. Like, wow, the Lord really gave me this. So... You know, here's my masterpiece, and, I, and I'll ask Nancy for input, and she's looking for what's wrong or what needs improvement. I remember once I, I came up with an introduction to a book I thought was going to be a brilliant, different for me, kind of a creative introduction to a book about the power of music, how God can change the world one song at a time. And, and I, I printed it up, and I, I gave it to her, and she gave it back to me. <laughs> with written in red across the top, total fail. <laughs> total fail. <laughs> but I, she wasn't trying to attack me personally. She wasn't trying to put me down. She asked, I asked for her input, that was number one. And number two, she just wants me to glorify the Lord and do the best thing. And I said to her, Hannah, I really felt the Lord gave me that. And she said, well, not to start the book. So, all right, let me think about it a little bit. It, so sometimes when, when she has constructive criticism, my flesh can come up, but then it's like, well, why is, she, why is she telling me this? You know, if your vocal coach or your musical coach or your sports coach or your academic coach is giving you input, it's because they want you to succeed. If you are conscious of the fact that as a child of God, God is for you, not against you, then you receive the input, you receive the correction, Gladly. And here's the amazing thing about that call from David Wilkerson. And I preached there dozens of times after that and, and had a wonderful experience in the, being part of that amazing church over those years. But the couple, the leadership couple that I mentioned, the wife had called me. They, she was frustrated when she got off the phone with me because I wasn't hearing what she had to say. So she and her husband prayed, and they said, Lord, Mike won't listen to us, but he'll listen to Leonard Ravenhill or David Wilkerson, so have one of them call him. <laughs> and what God convicted me about, the thing that Brother Dave gave me input on, I was actually already praying about that. I, I sensed something that, that I needed to adjust. And I was already praying about that. So his input was wonderful, timely. God used it. But I didn't resist that for a split second. That wasn't the thing God really dealt with me about. What God dealt me with about was my proud response to a colleague. That's what he dealt with me about. The insecurity of it and the proud response. That was the real issue. And David Wilkerson told me one day that he had reached out to some very famous preachers, a couple of them who had destroyed their ministries through immorality, sexual immorality. And he said to me, Mike, sexual immorality was not their big problem. Pride was. Pride was. And, and when, you, when you look back over your life and you think, okay, why is it this one messed up and God somehow preserved me? Why did this one fall this way? God kept me. The, the, the one thing aside from grace, 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 but that grace is available to everybody, Right? He doesn't show favoritism. I'm really going to help you, but I'm not going to help you. No, that's not who he is. So the only thing I can say I contributed was learning to humble myself, learning to get low. And as a new believer, I just lost my temper. Folks in the church, and got so ornery. I had this terrible, horrific temper before I was saved. And uh, it reared its head up when I was just a couple weeks old in the Lord. So I, I had to go and apologize to somebody in the church that I had really been nasty to. And when I went to see him, you know, the next service, 
I went to apologize. He just smiled at me. He just smiled. It's like, hey, you're just young. That's right. We all made mistakes. And I thought, this is the forgiveness they showed. What, what a testimony. But then I realized, good to get low. It's good to get low. And something once happened during the Brownsville Revival where Pastor Kilpatrick got very upset with a critic saying some very ugly, ugly things about the church, and, and he lashed out. And then God convicted him about it. And even though this guy was savaging us and attacking us with his national ministry in, in the ugliest ways, and really speaking against what the Holy Spirit was doing, and Pastor Kilpatrick was kind of protective over his church, he, he, he spoke out of, out of line. So he called me over to his house one day, and he said, he said Mike, I'm... I'm writing up a statement. I want you to help me write it up and get it out. I'm apologizing to him. I said, You're apologizing? He said, yeah, I have to apologize. So as he's writing the statement or sh sharing it, reading it, dictating some, and I'm typing it because I'm going to get it out as best as we can, distribute it, uh, I was kind of cringing. Like, do you, do you really want to say that? Do you, do you really want to get that low? And he said, Mike, Man of God once told me, if you're going to humble yourself, do it right. <laughs> do it right. And I watched God pour out his grace and Pastor Kilpatrick for doing it. So I, I encourage you, have that place of humility before God based on security in your relationship with him. And then out of that, be, be a sponge for correction. Be a sponge for input. Learn to humble yourself. And even if someone is wrong, you, you get low and, and, and God will raise you up. And really, before the Lord, I don't mean because of sin that we get low. I mean because of humility. The lower you go, the higher you go. Right? Jesus says in Luke 14 that whoever humbles themselves will be exalted. Whoever exalts themselves will be humble. You say, well, why do I want to be exalted if, if, if I'm humble? You don't, that's the whole thing. When you humble yourself, you're not looking to be a big shot. He can raise you up and give you a worldwide ministry. You don't really care because you're glorifying Jesus. When Daniel Kalender first took over Bonke's ministry and was preaching to these massive crowds and miracles were happening and he texted me just all excited. Three, three kids who had all gone blind through disease were kids of the same mother were all instantly healed in one of the meetings and Everyone rejoicing, and, and I just said, man, I'm so thrilled to see how God's using you. And, you know, he didn't respond saying, yeah, the crowds are amazing or the numbers are amazing. He wrote back and said, Jesus has captured my heart. So that's what matters. And, and, and when the things that have so much appeal in the world don't matter to us anymore, then God can usually do anything. And, and as, as we're... As, as, we look at, say, the healing revival out of which Christ for the Nations was birthed. There were so many that were anointed with incredible power, extraordinary ministries. Very few made it to the end. Very few. One of the most prominent ones died before he was 40. A healing evangelist died before he was 40. And some of the leaders went to pray, and the Lord said, don't pray. Was this, in other words, this sickness is unto death. And, and then we see so, so many people in recent years with these extraordinary prophetic gifts, and, and they've all messed up. I think you get a little power. You get just an unusual gift operating, and you suddenly you think you're somebody. And it's Nancy and I have often talked about, like, how much can God really entrust us with before it goes to our heads? So... Again, just remember the principle, the, the lower you go, and not false humility, but from the heart, you really, you, you want to receive truth in life. God can bless you. That's what Proverbs says, rebuke a wise man and he'll love you. Go with me to Luke 16, and I want to end here. Just some practical principles, the things that, that God's looking for. My dad once asked me when I was a kid, he said, Mark, you're good in math, right? I said, yeah. He said, all right. He said, um, 
You get on the elevator, and there are three people on the elevator. You go up to the third floor, two people get on, one person gets off. You go up to the fifth floor, four people get on, two people get off. You go up to the eighth floor, five people get on, four people get off. You go up to the tenth floor, one person gets on, nobody gets off. So I'm waiting for him to ask me how many people are on the elevator, right? He says to me, how many stops did the elevator make? I wasn't, that's the joke, I wasn't counting that. He never told me what I was supposed to be counting, I just made an assumption. So sometimes we think God's looking at this, this, this. He's looking at something totally different. He's looking at something totally different. So Luke 16, there's the, the very interesting parable of the shrewd manager. We, we, won't, we won't go through all of that here. But beginning in verse 10, there are principles that Jesus gives. Principles that he gives. Verse 10, whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much. And whoever is dishonest with very little will also be dishonest with much. Pause there for a minute. Just a simple principle to follow and live by and remember. When I first went on radio in 2008, I I knew I was supposed to be on national radio And we were on more local stations initially. And and I said, Lord, if you'll give me a million listeners a day, I'll make this the best possible show it could ever be. I didn't need to hear God speak the answer to that to me. (laughs) And immediately my my brain spoke it to me. Make it the best it can possibly be, and then I'll give you the million listeners. You know, I said, oh, if I could only be here, do it. Oh, if I was, uh, look, I was just preaching in the nursing home to precious old people with dementia. They don't even, you know. I, if I was preaching like to a million people, I'd really prepare a good message. You know, if I was a, wasn't leading worship for chapel, if it was like for, you know, passion festival or something, then I'd really do my best or whatever. And God said, no, no, what I'm looking at is, is right now, the here and now, the, the little. Are you faithful with the little that's been entrusted to you? And, and all your life, the little is going to keep growing, but each time it's going to be faithfulness to there, get you to the next stage. If you're waiting for the big stage, you'll never get there. If you're faithful in the little stage, you'll get to the big stage, whatever that looks like, right? So simple principle, faithful in little, faithful in much. Sometimes we just want to do the amazing big things. God's like, well, I see you're not nice to your roommate. Oh, God, excuse me to shake the nations. Uh, You're late for work again. You know, like, well, why, is it, why is God using that one, not me? And now we got all the, it's, it's not fair, it's a system, it's, it's, it's rigged. <laughs> no, it's, it's God. And sometimes what I found when there's a bigger thing God wants to do in me, he holds me back more. And I'm watching all these people run ahead. It's like, what I thought you told me I'd be doing this and this and this. He just wants to kill flesh more. He wants to get me more hungry and, and more desperate. So, so that I'm really crying out more. And then... It's like this rubber band that, you know, if you pull it back too far, it's, it's going to break. And you think, Lord, I, I've about reached my limit here. You know, this, is, this rubber band's about to break. But he knows it can go all the way back here. And then when he lets it go, boom, it's an explosion. Just like with me with writing, feeling called to write in 72 and not getting the release to really write until 89. It's exploded after that. Never stopped. And I'm glad it didn't explode earlier because he was doing things to to get me to that point. Faithful in little, faithful in much. Then he says this, if you have not been trustworthy in handing worldly wealth, who will trust you with true riches? You may have this amazing spiritual calling, but if you can't just get natural day-to-day things in order, you can't be trusted with the other. So again, you could look at it in different ways. You can look at it in terms of, okay, right now I've I've been asked to, well, Alistair Geddes, the director of Christ for the Nations, when he came here as an international student, one of the first coming over, was given a scholarship. He was all excited. Then he got here and and they told him, uh, you'll be working at the school. 
And one of his assignments, the man who became the director of the school in Long Island where I taught, one of his assignments was cleaning toilets. So be faithful in cleaning toilets and God may use you to clean more toilets or he may use you to reach 10 million people. You know, in the midst of the revival in Pensacola, when, you know, the leaders were really looked at as like, wow, you know, we'd go to speak somewhere. They didn't even know who we were, but the lines would form before the building. Our people would be waiting for hours to get into the building just because someone from the revival was speaking. Everyone wanted to get near you so you touch them and lay hands on them, like power going out for you. It was easy to like lift people up and now you're a student in the school and the midst of revival, wow. And I used to tell the students, listen, all the leaders in the revival, we are all nobodies. And you are in training to become nobodies. And I said, look, your job, we're gonna, here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna teach you, press the button. That's gonna be, we're gonna teach you to press the button. Now you don't know when you press the button, if it flushes the toilet downstairs, or if it sets off a nuclear bomb. Your job is just press the button. You have an assignment, be faithful to the assignment. And then when Reinhard Bonnke came, he talked about how God makes nobodies into somebodies. So I joked with him, I said, we turn somebodies into nobodies so God can turn nobodies into somebodies. You come in full of yourself, all these amazing, my uh, Christ for the nations is privileged to have someone like me sitting here. People really knew the calling on my life. You know, these speakers are okay, but oh, I'm just going through the motions here. So by God's grace, we turn you from somebody's into nobodies so that God can turn you into somebody because you don't care about that. You just want to glorify him. So faithful, and that was just little, faithful with much. Faithful with things in the natural, worldly finances, earthly things, faithful in the spiritual. And then listen, last one. And if you've not been trustworthy with someone else's property, who will give you property of your own? Most of you, when you go out from here, if you do get into ministry work or some vocational work that has to do with your future calling, you're most likely gonna be serving under somebody else initially. You know, some may just go out and pioneer something. Some of you may be older and, and with more ministry experience, but, but most, you start somewhere, right? And, and, and you serve somewhere else. And often it can be frustrating because you don't really get released to do what God's called you to do. Or the gifts you have aren't really recognized. Or it could be the leader is very wise and sees all the gifts, but knows you have to deal with these, these other issues first right? And, and it can be frustrating because I, I got a burden to do this. I, I feel called to do this. Or my vision is, to, or I, you know, I'm called to be a kingdom businessman and this company, they don't do things the best way. But if that's where God has you, be faithful in serving someone else's vision. Don't, don't, don't be fighting and combating. If that's where you are, learn, grow. If you're asked to sin, you don't sin. If you're asked to compromise, you don't compromise, obviously. But whatever you're entrusted with, serve within that. Okay, this is someone else's ministry. This is someone else's work. Maybe all that you do, their name is on it. Nobody knows your name. You do that, and God will trust you with something of your own. And then remember, it's the kingdom principle that we reap what we sow, right? So as, as I got close to Leonard Ravenhill the last five years of his life, from 82 to 87, Towards the end, as he was getting weaker and more frail, it was less about him pouring into me and more about me being an encouragement to him. I mean, he prayed for me all the time. But, you know, he looked forward to me calling after I got back from a trip just to share what God had been doing and things like that. And I remember thinking to myself, God willing, when I get to a point of life when I'm, when I'm much older, I, I want to sow things now the way I treat those who are older, so I'll be treated the same. And, and just hear me. If you are always undermining the ministries where you serve and always bad-mouthing the leaders, always complaining and griping, and there's a better way to do it, just remember that's what's going to happen with the folks that serve you. You're going to reap what you sow. So be honoring. You may have a difference. Right, but if it's their ministry, 
Ultimately, if you can't serve, either convictional differences, you leave with respect and honor, right? But, but otherwise, that's somebody else's. You know, you work at McDonald's. I could make a better uniform than this. It doesn't mean you wear the silly uniform. Well, this whole system, it's, it's not your responsibility. You can share a thought with a manager. Manager says, great idea, good. If not, you, you're doing work for somebody else. Do it with the attitude that you would want people to do it working with you, serving you. And, you know, over the years, because I'm, you know, there's so many areas where I wish I knew the Lord better and could be deeper and walking with him more closely. And then other areas where he's really got my heart and my attention over the years. So I'm, I'm really careful about how I speak about others. And during the most difficult spiritual conflict, the terrible split we went through, I, I'd be alone with Nancy in bed at night talking and I would mention the person's name because we were really, it was a painful, painful split. And we kind of lost everything in the process. And, and uh, I, I mentioned this, the one person's name I was having the conflict with. And, I, and I'd say, Lord, bless him and, and uh, honor him. And Nancy said, it's just the two of us in the bedroom. But I, I felt, I, I didn't want to be maligning the person even when it was just two of us because I was hurt. And, and when I, I went back and looked at some journal entries, and I found even when I journaled something, I still spoke blessing over the person. In my journal, just between God and me. And it was a consciousness, look, everybody's flawed one way or another. And most of the time when we go through difficulties, it's misunderstanding and the enemy gets in. And, and to throw each other under the bus is just, it's not the way to do it. So if, if you have that attitude of honoring, God will honor you. He, he will. And he'll give you platforms. And I could tell you stories. I mean, maybe tomorrow I'll, I'll share some or tonight. I don't know. But the way God's opened doors, the way I've seen him do things that can't be done. Let's tell you this one thing super quick. In 1998, Suzette Hatting, who used to be Reinhard Bonnke's chief intercessor, now a powerful evangelist for many years, She's at, at our school in Pensacola and has a prophetic word over me. And part of it was that I would sit with princes. It's never been my agenda to sit with princes. It's less than three weeks later, I'm in England for some meetings and a colleague says, hey, Mike, he said, uh, he's friends with the royal family. He said, I'm having dinner with Prince Andrew uh, tomorrow night. He said, I, I could get a table next to us and just you show up and I can introduce you. I said, nah, that feels a little forced to me. If we're supposed to meet, we'll meet. I wasn't even thinking of this prophecy. Next to me, find out you have a private meeting with Prince Andrew at Buckingham Palace. And, and you know, I got to, got to share my testimony with him. He let me pray for him. Not to receive the Lord, but let me pray for him. The point is like, how does that happen? Right, this is a complete random thing. If you ask me, give me a million things you plan to do on England, that wouldn't have been on the list. But if God wants to do it, he can do it. He's the one who opens doors. He's the one who closes doors. Honor him, get low. All things are possible. Amen? Amen. All right, I got to run. See you tonight. Thank you.